Hi, everybody. Aren't we excited for the event? My name is Dave Banuj, Dave Banuj Dasgupta. I am board co-chair with Shireen, um, who couldn't be here today. But before we start, I just want to make a quick um, house announcement. If you're in the back, you can start moving forward if you want to, because we do have, we're letting the people on the waiting list in. Some of you are here already, so without disturbing Professor Ahmed, we can have people like percolate in the back. So if you are kind enough and want to come up front and enjoy the talk, we'd love you to do that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity just to welcome everyone and welcome you to the 2017 Kessler Lecture. M my name is Justin Brown, and I'm the executive director of the Center for LGBTQ Studies, better known as CLAGS. I also um, just want to take this opportunity to also uh, mention I, we apologize for the um, not having ASL services available here this evening. However, um, closed captioning will be um, provided on the live stream, um, and that will be uh, promptly posted um, at the completion of this evening. Um, so with that, uh, when CLAGS began over 25 years ago, it was the first university-based research center that was truly dedicated to the work of the LGBT community broadly um, but very dedicated to the focused work that will help move us and our community forward. CLACT has always been focused on providing opportunities for information and education through our free and public-based programming, um, such as events like this. And with that, um, in order for us to continue this work and to continue pushing forward for social change, we ask that you uh, also take this chance this evening. If you haven't, um, please sign up, become a, uh, become a member of CLAGS, and or provide any small donation that you can for us as a part of our work here. And this is very important as we continue um, in the time of various budget cuts and also critical um, examination and questioning of how important our work is and how vital it is today. With that, as part of our work, we recognize the scholarship of those that continue to advocate for social change. Tonight's award, Kessler, uh, is given to a scholar whose substantive body of work and, pre and presence has made such an endless and everlasting impact on the field of LGBTQ studies. Tonight, our recipient, Dr. Sarah Ahmed, is the 25th recipient of this award. For her, and we recognize her for her tireless efforts and her continuous efforts to push the field forward as we continue to strive and lead to social change and equity for all. With that, before introducing Dr. Ahmed, we do have some testimonials from many of those that have been close to her in her life. So we're going to spend some brief moments in receiving those. And our first testimonial will be by Chandra Frank. Thank you so much um, to everybody from City University of New York for inviting me to be part of this very special celebration um, to honor Sarah Ahmed's scholarship. I can just about see you. <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Dear Sarah, let me first start by saying thank you. And this is a collective thank you, a feminist thank you, a queer thank you, and all these thank yous need to be celebrated. I speak tonight as one of your former students as a PhD candidate at Goldsmiths, a lecturer and curator. In all those capacities, your work has inspired words onto paper, communal learning, and art strategies. I'm so pleased in particular 
when work that happens in the academy finds home in unexpected places and new places. I think your work is willful for that very reason. In living a feminist life, you speak of feminist communities being shaped by passing books around. You've named and shared so many of your lifelines with us, and your writing has become a lifeline to me and so many others. I love how multiple of my students read their living and feminist life books on the underground and started feminist killjoy groups. They probably report to me that they're now in the feminist business of killing joy. No dinner party is left untouched. Feminist killjoys leave traces behind. You speak of feminism as a building project, world making. We have, you seen you, we have seen you make worlds. A feminist roadmap full of queer side paths and invitations delivered by dancing arms. I love that I've developed a healthy feminist suspicion of arms speaking to me in texts or in artworks. Feminist kinship looks like arms reaching in, closing in. A speculative feminism is what your words offer. I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone from our Goldsmiths feminist student community when I say thank you for how you've been questioning and breaking down the structures of the institution, for saying yes, sexual harassment happens here, right here, for knowing and listening. Institutional silences have become boringly familiar. At Goldsmiths, Sarah modeled a different kind of feminist listening, a patient listening, an angry listening, a listening that makes clear that we need to learn to unlisten the mechanisms of the institution they speak. Often they tell us to turn away, to move on, or simply beyond. Where is Sarah Ahmed? A question haunting the desk, toilets, and walls of goldsmiths. Where is Sarah Ahmed? Your name across the bathroom stalls is a feminist calling. I hope everyone reads these words as an invitation. You speak of feminist killjoy armies, and I can't lie, I have visions of them coming out of bathroom stalls now. The figure of the feminist killjoy is so generative. She allows to breathe dreams into words. Start following her around and she will follow you. At the Archives Matter Conference at Goldsmiths we organized, you spoke about how sometimes we need to disappear to survive. I've been thinking about those words and how black and brown students balance whole lives between disappearance and survival. Where do we go? Who will pick up our arms? We need a future archive filled with questions on survival. We need materials that are willing to be unruly. This is why we need thinkers, writers, and professors who are willing to be honest that the institution has nothing to offer black and brown students if we don't break down the very structures that pacify us. People who, in your words, will take care of our fragile archives. Throughout my time at Goldsmiths, I have heard Sarah speak about institutional housework, which continuously makes me reflect on what it means to be in the institution, to be complicit, and especially as a brown woman in an anti-black institution. Making feminist life worlds means ma having many uncomfortable and honest conversations. Feminist toolkits are built and rebuild, and thank you for that. This is a thank you for showing us the courage to break down walls, one chip at a time. It takes strength and vulnerability. I know that feminism is survival work because of the work that you do to survive. This is a collective witnessing of that work. This gathering and this award is beyond your work. It's a way for all of us to say thank you and to acknowledge what it means that you came before us. For how throughout your work you've managed to describe what irked us, what caused friction, what caused pain, for dancing with words and following them around. I take this award as an invitation to cite, write, and think with care. It's a communal celebration of the arrival work we all do, to disappear, to survive, but most of all, it's an acknowledgement that we were already here. Thank you so much. Our next testimonial will be provided by Dr. Sarah Franklin. So hello, everybody. Um, it's a great honor and a privilege to celebrate Sarah's contribution to LGBTQ scholarship. Um, and to share this award ceremony with you tonight. <laughs> um, I might get a bit emotional, which would probably be fitting. Um, 
Sara's work has reached out and touched people in so many ways. Her writing is a lifeline, although never a rescue effort. Over many years, she has crafted a method of description that is also an intervention. Her method is one of integration. She begins with an event, a feeling, an aside, a perception. She connects it to a past, a pattern, an accumulation. And then she shows how even a fleeting sense of a change of atmosphere or mood in a room can be described as institutional, structural, and formative. Sara has not only invented, but honed, refined, and tempered a vital method of diagnosis that combines everyday personal experiences of racism, sexism, homophobia, and exclusion with theory, analysis, and political critique. Her work is poetic, catalyzing, fairly accurate, and oddly comforting. She's incredibly good at explaining what isn't obvious about the very things that seem so self-evident. Her work is revolutionary and transformative, sophisticated but accessible, her own, but always generously and thoughtfully linked to the work of other scholars and activists so that its methodology is itself a form of solidarity. So how has she created this incredible toolkit for all of us to use to understand and to change our world? Well, I can tell you, it's incredibly hard work. <clears throat> and Sara is a meticulous professional. Of course, the writing itself is hard, as any art or truth is hard. But the really hard part is the hearing, the listening, the persistence of staying with the feelings that have to be kept close and fully felt and repeatedly encountered in order to be explicated, recognized, situated, and then reassembled. Sara's writing extends our encounters with alienation, negation, and hard histories in order to reorientate them. Sorry, to reorient them. <laughs> I'm here. Um, <laughs> but, these, but these are bruising encounters. Writing for Sara is also an antidote to these sore points. Even before she became post-institutional, Sara has always been very disciplined about her writing and rigorous in her planning for each new project. She has a long-term plan for every project, but also a precise set of deadlines. She even has a list of what she's going to do every day, and it's rare that she does not complete on time or even early. Over time, I have come to appreciate that maintaining this daily structure is essential to being able to write so intimately and personally and powerfully and consistently about issues that are incredibly painful and difficult, often even to acknowledge at all. Because this work is very hard and is also incredibly risky and costly and wearing it wears you down, it tires you out, it's exhausting. And this is really why we are all here tonight. It's so important to look after each other, especially in these very difficult times. It's crucial that we celebrate each other and our solidarity, much as we are all working in very different ways to find our voice and bring about change. So I wanna thank you all for making this celebration possible. And above all, I wanna thank Sara for her dedication, her persistence, her tenacity, and her wise and willful words. I can't possibly finish without also thanking Poppy, <laughs> who would so love to be here right now, and who loves Sarah beyond words. But to finish properly, I also want to send Sarah a message from all of us. Dear Sarah, 
We are here to celebrate you tonight because you have to experience the shuddering to narrate the reassembly because sometimes the handle breaks because we need our connections to sustain ourselves and to persist. So we want you to know, Sara, that when you fly off the handle, that we have got your back, that your leaks are our leaks, that we have inherited your willfulness, your fight, and your tears. Thank you for your shelter. We have joined your army. We share your wear and tear. Long live feminist snap and queer hap. Long live the wild wiggle and roll. Ahmed. So our final testimonial is from Dr. Judith Butler. And so without further ado. My only regret on this joyful occasion is that I cannot be there more than virtually. I'm thankful for this happiness that the virtual makes possible, but the virtual is also my unhappiness. I am happy in some very specific ways. I'm really delighted and happy to be honoring Sara Ahmed. And this perhaps tells us something about that emotional state that she herself has taught us. I am truly happy to honor her. I am honored that I am able to experience this happiness on this occasion in which we assemble to affirm the extraordinary gift of what Sara Ahmed writes and speaks. So when we say, for instance, that we delight in Sara Ahmed, we generally mean that she is the occasion of a new sense of what it means to be alert thinking, what it means to think in language, a language by which we are addressed and which we use to address others and the world, even, they, even when they refuse to listen or, and refuse to read. We are, with Ahmed, suddenly creatures with alert senses. We take in our world and we realize that it was, before reading her, too hard to take in this world. Perhaps it impinged upon us or perhaps it overwhelmed us, but with her, as we accompany her, as she invites us to read her words, we are suddenly and irreversibly capable of seeing and speaking what we must call the truth of our world. Maybe we are skeptical of claims such as these, but even though Ahmed's writing is knowing and ironic, she is not skeptical. She is dedicated to describing the world as it is. Of course, this task should not be so hard, but one effect of the force of racism is to distort reality, and so to distort and damage the senses of those who seek to understand its enduring damage, even its unspeakable damage. With Ahmed, even when we are presented with unspeakable outrage, we still speak or we seek in the ways that are possible for us to continue to make sense of the world, not to close down the senses, to sense the sense and to speak it in whatever way is possible. In so many of her works, Ahmed speaks back. That alone would not be remarkable if it were not the case that so many people have no way of speaking back. They take the damage in living out its curse, but Sara Ahmed assembles us as she writes, 
writing not just for herself, but for women, women of color, for the oppressed, for those for whom silence has become a deadly sentence. She tells us what has happened. She recounts a story. She takes it apart, syllable by syllable. She exposes the racism, the sexism, the hatred, the grammatical structure of oppression, showing how it works not only in the way she is addressed or effaced through non-address, but how it is possible not to accept it, not to take it, to turn it, to turn the poisonous utterance over, expect, inspect its parts, to take it apart, to send it back, not in the service of hatred, of more hatred, surely not, but rather in the service of what we must still call equality. So there is truth and there is equality, and these are the names for what drives this work, for the promise of this work, and they are component parts of what we can now call the promise of happiness. Indeed, in her book, The Promise of Happiness, she shows that what we call the good life presupposes certain social conditions for its realization. Can we know what happiness is by the way it is used in language? The semantic field of happiness includes forms of making happy and being made, made happy. It is irreducibly complex and so Ahmed does not take the Aristotelian path, seeking to know what happiness is in order then to pursue happiness as a goal. Rather, she asks us to join her in suspending the belief that happiness is a good thing. She suggests that we change the kind of question we ask and patiently reflect upon how objects make us feel. This remark already made me happy. As a reader, I am both disconcerted and relieved. She takes the philosophical question apart, turns it around, inspects the parts as she separates them from one another, and then forms a new object for our consideration. For instance, if we claim that certain objects make us happy or promise happiness for us, we assume that objects act upon us in some way. Are objects then the cause of our happiness or our unhappiness? Do they cause our feelings? Perhaps, as Ahmed suggests, certain objects are conceived as social goods and then are attributed with the causal power to make us happy. Her conclusion is that any moral consideration of how happiness might constitute the ultimate aim or value of life must understand first how the social formation and circulation of affectively invested objects constitutes the field in which we pursue happiness. When the good life becomes an object we seek to have or an objective we seek to realize, we have to step back and ask whose life is considered good and who decides those terms. So even in this analysis, we can see that subjects, objects, and the circulation of affect belong together in any analysis of culture, that her version of cultural studies, the field in which she is trained, requires a form of philosophical reflection. The question of happiness thus opened up a new framework for culture, philosophy, and affect theory. That is one reason we're here today, to honor her. Of course, there is a political struggle that this analysis of language opens up. She opens up language in the service of that struggle. She offers us key cultural figures in order to ask us to suspend our usual ways of knowing, to make an object of reflection of those usual ways. Some of those figures are treated by mainstream culture as if they are an obstruction to the happiness of others. The feminist killjoys, the unhappy queers, the melancholic migrants, to name a few. The cultural presumption that living in LGBTQI ways of life will make for unhappiness 
will constitute unhappy life, will be unhappy for the one who names any of those modes of life as one's own desire or necessity. The semantic problem of happiness becomes clearly implicated in oppressive normative orders when the unhappy queer becomes happily queer in the face of the prediction that non-normative sexuality or gender will bring about unhappiness. That prediction is in fact an indictment, an emblem of the very oppressive system it claims only to anticipate. That prediction, you will be unhappy, does the work of oppression. It is oppressive. She does not prepare a rejoinder of the sort that would say, but we are happy, even though sometimes, like tonight, we really are happy. <laughs> she writes, we may need to defend our arguments by not making happiness our ground while exposing the shakiness of happiness as a ground. What seems most important is that those who are oppressed are labeled as unhappy by those who either imp impose that oppression um, through non-acknowledgement um, and, and allow for its reproduction and intensification. When any of us actively and loudly oppose forms of racism, misogyny, class oppression, the oppression of physically challenged peoples, colonial domination, as in Palestine or in Puerto Rico, Indeed, when we start, for instance, as we do and as we must, to name Puerto Rico as the abandoned and devastated place where an active struggle against colonial domination now demands to be heard, the evisceration of indigenous rights and claims, anti-Arab racism and Islamophobia, we are then quickly branded as malcontents who get in the way of a happiness that is understood to be the zone of privilege, the slick operation of white supremacy and pervasive misogyny and rank homophobia and transphobia. Either we are said to be unhappy or we are getting in the way of the happiness of those who seek to enjoy their privilege and reproduce the oppression by which they benefit. So yes, According to those terms, we stay unhappy. But that is because we seek to live in a world of dignity, equality, freedom, a world that dismantles racist, racist structures meticulously and thoroughly. What those who accuse us of uh, um, when they tell us we are unhappy or tell us we are killing joy, um, what they accuse us of is a radical, careful, and thorough, even fatal dismantling of the structures of oppression. But that fatal and meticulous dismantling does not make for unhappiness. It makes for a new sense of the world. In fact, it relieves the senses from their dulled and damaged conditions, allows us at once to achieve freedom and equality and to be able to live as sensate creatures in a world, to live with feeling as if for the first time or perhaps truly to feel the world for the first time. With Sara Ahmed's permission, I would like to, would like to call this happiness. The slumber from which she wakes us with her impassioned, careful, philosophical and political argument is one um, in, that um, can be understood as our failure to recognize um, the oppression um, under which we live, a failure that depended crucially on her meticulous and relentless skills. I am only unhappy in that in these few minutes that I have to thank and honor uh, Sarah Ahmed, um, I am only able to express my limitless happiness as I read her and listen to her um, within a very limited time. I've not yet been able to underscore 
um, the in, her incredibly rich understanding of media, cultural analysis, social theory, social movements, sociology, phenomenology, and the philosophy of moral sentiments. I read her and I suddenly feel the depths of my lungs. How is that possible? This work is not simply a breath of fresh air, uh, but gives us somatically the very possibility of breathing, of breathing in this world in which strangulation is both a metaphor and a reality, the metaphor that takes shape as reality in various forms of police violence, in the racist and homophobic and transphobic structures that decide who will be able to breathe in this world and who will not. Let me conclude my remarks by reminding you of uh, a killjoy manifesto. <laughs> That's included in her recently published book, Living a Feminist Life. There she makes several carefully interrelated declarations. Here are some of them. I am not willing to make happiness my cause. I am willing to cause unhappiness. I am willing to support others who are willing to cause unhappiness. I am not willing to laugh at jokes that cause offense. I am not willing to get over histories that are not over. I am not willing to be included if inclusion means being included in a system that is unjust, violent, and unequal. I am willing to live a life that is deemed by others as unhappy, and I am willing to reject and widen the scripts available for what counts as a good life. But then also, I am willing to put the hap back in happiness, and I am willing to snap any bonds, however precious, when those bonds are damaging to myself or to others. And then I am willing to participate in a killjoy movement. So this first person I is one we are all invited to try out, to try on. I am willing to be the one who makes others unhappy by refusing to go along with injustice. But I am also the one who finds the hap in happiness by which is meant that sometimes what happens to you can be the occasion for something new, some outbreak of equality or freedom or solidarity. She remarks that we sometimes get in the way of ourselves and sometimes stumble. Something has happened that does not seem to be precisely the result of my willfulness. And yet, as she writes, and here I quote, I stumble, maybe by stumbling, I found you. Maybe by stumbling, I stumbled on happiness, a hapful happiness, a happiness that is as fragile as the bodies we love and cherish, end quote. What happiness for us is then, um, what, happiness, what happiness this is then, that Sara Ahmed's work got in our way, that we stumbled upon it, each of us, in a different time and place, and that this has led us further down a queer path toward a more just and bearable world. How happy I am that I stumbled upon your words, Sarah, fierce and careful, and how happy I am to thank you and to honor you with countless others. Thank you. And so now, um, if we could all take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Sarah Ahmed.
Thank you so much. I'm just so overwhelmed to be here. A queer life, a feminist life is a collaborative project. And tonight, for me, it is all about the collaboration, the mentors, the students, the partners, the friends. It is about spaces like CLAGs that provide us with homes and institutions. So I want to start my consideration of queer use by attending to uses of queer. Queer, a word with a history. Queer, a word that has been flung like a stone, picked up and hurled at us, a word we can claim for us. Queer, odd, strange, unseemly, disturbed, disturbing. Queer, a feeling, a sick feeling, feeling queer as feeling nauseous. In older uses of queer, queer to describe anything that was noticeable because it was odd, queer and fragility were often companions. In one of George Eliot's essays, Three Months in Weimar, the narrator describes the sound of an old piano thus. Its tones now so queer and feeble, like those of an invalided old woman, whose voice could once make a heart beat with fond passion. Feeble, frail, invalid, incapacitate, falter, weak, tearful, worn, tear, wear, queer too, queer is there too. These proximities tell a story. A queer life might be how we get in touch with things at the very point at which they or we are worn or worn down, those moments when we break or break down, when we shatter under the weight of history. The sounds of an old piano evoking the sound of an old woman, could this evocation vibrate with affection, could a queer heart beat with passion for what is wavering and quavering. That some of us can live our lives by assuming that word queer by saying yes to that word, shows how a past use is not exhaustive of a word or thing, however exhausted a word or thing. As Judith Butler notes in Excitable Speech, so lovely to echo her words, an aesthetic enactment of an injurious word may both use the word and mention it, that is, use the word to produce certain effects, but also at the same time, make reference to that very use, calling attention to it as a citation, situating that use within a citational legacy, making that use into an explicit, discursive item to be reflected on rather than a taken for granted operation of ordinary language. We can disrupt the meaning of an insult by making its usage audible as a history that does not decide once and for all what a word can do. To queer use might be to make use audible, to listen to use, to bring to the front what ordinarily recedes into the background. Sometimes words are reused as if they could be cut off from their history. When an insult is thrown out, for instance, and reaches its target shattering, but is defended as just banter, as something you can or should make light of. If we reuse the word queer, we hold on to the weight, the baggage. Eve Sedgwick suggests that what makes queer a politically potent term is how it cleaves to childhood scenes of shame. Queer acquires force and vitality precisely because we refuse to use the word to make light of that history. To recycle or reuse a word is to reorientate one's relation to a scene that holds its place as memory, as container, however leaky. Queer as reused, reuse as queer use. In today's lecture, I'll be drawing on arguments from a book I've recently completed entitled, What's the Use? In the book, I follow use around the way I followed happiness 
in the promise of happiness and the will in willful subjects. Use is a small word, yes, but it has a big history. It's very busy. And use has had many uses. So following use has allowed me to connect bodies of work that are usually assumed to be distinct, such as literatures in design and biology that make use of use to explain the acquisition of form. So following use has allowed me to explore how worlds are shaped from, as it were, the bottom up. So the first section is called Uses of Use. So in this section, I want to offer a meditation on use as biography, as a way of telling a story of things. Use, when used as a verb, can mean to employ for some purpose, to expend or consume, to treat or behave toward, to take unfair advantage of or exploit, to habituate or accustom. Use is a relation as well as an activity that often points beyond something, even when use is about something, to use something points to what something is for. Some objects are made in order to be used. We might call these simply designed objects. What they are for brings them into existence. A cup is made in order that I have something to drink from. It is shaped this way with a hole as its heart, empty so it can be filled by liquid. We might summarize the implied relation as for is before. However, even if something is shaped around what it is for, that is not the end of the story. As Howard Rosati notes in A Theory of Craft, use need not correspond to intended function. Most, if not all, objects can have a use or more accurately be made usable by being put to use. A sledgehammer can pound or it can be used as a paperweight or lever. A handsaw can cut a board and be used as a straight edge or to make music. A chair can be sat in and used to prop open a door. These uses make them useful objects, but since they are unrelated to the intended purpose and function for which these objects were made, knowing these uses doesn't necessarily reveal much about these objects. So use can correspond to intended function, but use does not necessarily correspond to intended function. This not, not necessarily, is an opening. I'm not so sure that uses are quite as unrevealing about things as Rosati implies. Knowing these uses doesn't necessarily reveal much about these objects. I'm being told something about the qualities of a sledgehammer, that it can be used to be a paperweight, that a sledgehammer can be used as a paperweight tells me something about the heaviness of the sledgehammer. Something cannot be used for anything, which means that use is a restriction of possibility that is material. Nevertheless, there is something queer about use because intentions do not exhaust possibilities. The keys that are used to unlock a door can be used as a toy, perhaps because they are shiny and silver, perhaps because they jangle. Queer uses, when things are used for purposes other than the ones for which they were intended, still reference the qualities of things. Queer uses might even linger on those qualities, rendering them all the more lively. Queer use might also be thought of as improper use, or queer use as perversion. The word perversion can refer not only to a deviation from what is right or true, but to the improper use of something. Perhaps the child who turns the key into a toy is not a pervert, because a child is, after all, expected to play with such things. But a boy who plays with the wrong toy, a toy hoover, for instance, should never exist, but they do exist, <laughs> that is intended for a girl, might be understood as perverted or at least as on the way to perversion. Correcting the boy's use of the toy is, is, is about correcting more than the behavior in relation to the toy. It is correcting how the boy is boy. And note here that when we speak of proper use, we might be thinking of parts of the body as well as objects. So let me advance a speculative thesis that compulsory heterosexuality 
could operate as a form of intended functionality. We are allowed to play with our bits, to roam around each other's bodies as well as our own, but we must use them for the purpose for which it is assumed they are intended. The pervert delays or postpones getting to the point. The figure of the pervert comes up as the one whose misuse of things, and things can include bodies, is a form of self-revelation. Note also the implication in Rosati's argument that use makes something usable. So this means that what makes something possible comes after, and I think we're more used to thinking of possibility as preceding actuality. So use might have what you would call a kind of strange or queer temporality. Use also makes something used. When we think of something as being used, we might think of buying something secondhand, like this book, which was a book on hands that was handy. So a used book is always cheaper, or usually cheaper, than a new book. And the more signs of usage, like with this one there's a lot of underlining, the more signs of usage, the less value. Unless the user is esteemed when the value of a person can rub off on the value of a thing. Marx discusses wear and tear in relation to machines in Capital. He writes, the material wear and tear of a machine is of two kinds. The one arises from use as coins wear away by circulating, the other from non-use as a sword rusts when left in its scabbard. So Marx showed how machinery intensifies rather than saves labour. You have to get the most of the machine before it wears out. A wearing out that is passed on to workers, wearing as passing on and passing out, used as used up. Wear and tear in this economy is the loss of value determined as the extraction of value. To value use might require a change of values. We might value worn things broken things, for the life they lived, for how they show what they know, the scratch as pedagogy, the wrinkle as expression. To value use would not be to romanticise what is preserved as a historical record. Signs of life can be signs of exhaustion, which is to say, signs of life can be signs of how a life has been extinguished. Perhaps we can think of use as a record of the fragility of a life. In writing about use, I deliberately made use of used books. With this book in my hands, I could tell that others had been here before. I think of the reader who circled the word grief, the third line up. I cannot trace you, but you left a trace. Use leaves traces in places. Something might be in use or out of use. When something breaks, it might be taken out of use, rather like this cup, which has lost its handle, <laughs> a rather sad parting. When we think of something in use, we might think of a sign on a door, like this one, occupied. The sign tells us the toilet is in use. It tells us that we cannot use the toilet until whoever is using the toilet is finished. So use often comes with instructions, not just about how to use objects, but instructions that are about maintaining social and bodily boundaries. Or we'll take this image of a post box. There is a sign that politely asks a would-be poster not to use the post box by posting a letter into the box. So in the previous image, the toilet was occupied because it was in use. In this case, the post box is out of use because it is occupied. Although, of course, from the point of view of the birds, the post box is in use, but not as a box. It has become a nest. It has become a nest for nesting birds. So intended functionality can mean who something is for, not just what something is for. And this means that something can be used by those for which it was not intended. Queer use. That a post box can become a nest still tells us something about the nature of the object. We learn about form. When a change of function does not require a change of form, the same shape that can facilitate posting a letter can facilitate a nesting bird. But that change still requires a sign, please do not use, a sign that is in use, 
to stop what would be usual, which is posting a letter through the box. That sign we assume is temporary and the box will come back into use as a post box when it ceases to be a nest. Back into use. Use can involve comings and goings. Take this example of a well-trodden path. The path exists in part because people have used it. Use involves contact and friction. The tread of feet smooths the surface. The path is becoming smoother, easier to follow. The more a path is used, the more a path is used. How strange that this sentence makes sense. <laughs> Without use, a path can disappear, becoming overgrown, bumpy, or unusable like this path. We know it's a path because of a sign, but you can hardly see the sign for the leaves. Use can be necessary, then, for preservation. Use it or lose it. This is not only a mantra in personal training, which it apparently is. It can become a philosophy of life, not using, not being. A path can appear like a line on a landscape, but a path can also be a route through life. Collectivity can be acquired as direction. The more a path is traveled upon, the clearer it becomes. A path can also be kept clear, maintained. You can be supported by how a route is cleared. Heterosexuality, for instance, can become a path, a route through life, a path that is kept clear and maintained not only by the frequency of use, and frequency can be thought effectively as an invitation, but by an elaborate support system. When it is harder to proceed, when a path is harder to follow, you might be discouraged. You might try and find another route. A consciousness of the need to make more of an effort can be a disincentive. Just think of how we can be dissuaded by perpetual reminders of just how hard something will be. Deviation is hard. Deviation is made hard. Thoughts and feelings, they too have paths. Within empirical psychology, the path is in use as a way of thinking about thought. John Locke, for example, once suggested that thoughts, once they are going, continue in the same shape they are used to, which by often treading are worn into a smooth path and the motion in it becomes easy and, as it were, natural. Used to, that which is a wearing, how a shape is acquired, a history of use as a history of becoming natural. William James in his psychology cites the work of Dumont on habit, Everyone knows a garment having been worn a certain time clings better to the shape of a body than when it was new. A lock works better after being used some time. At the outset, a certain force was required to overcome certain roughness in the mechanism. The overcoming of their resistance is a phenomena of habituation. A garment becomes more attuned to the body the more the garment is worn. It is becoming clinging. I'll return to the well-used garment in due course. The example of the lock and the key suggests that it is through use that things become easier to use. And this is how acts of use are the building block of habit. If we took habit as the unit, we might miss these smaller steps which accumula accumulate to take us somewhere. If use takes time, use saves time. Less effort is required to complete an action. The idea that use keeps something alive or that using something makes something easier to use is supplemented by another idea central to the emergence of modern biology, that use in making something stronger and disuse in making something weaker shapes the very form of life. For example, Lamarck, the French naturalist who first used the word biology in its modern sense, offered as his primary law the law of use and disuse. He writes... A more frequent and continuous use of any organ gradually strengthens, develops, and enlarges that organ and gives it a power proportional to the length of time it has been so used, while the permanent disuse of any organ imperceptibly weakens and deteriorates it and progressively diminishes the functional capacity until it finally disappears. These acquired modifications for Lamarck can be inherited, what was called in his second principle, use inheritance. So what is used or disused for Lamarck is dependent on the environment. Use is how an organism receives a message 
from the environment, a, a message about what it needs to survive. Lamarck's famous example is the giraffe's long neck, although he only uses this example once. And his other famous example is the blacksmith's strong arm, which he doesn't use at all. And bio examples are themselves very interesting as examples of biographies of use. For Lamarck, the giraffe's neck grows longer not through an act of conscious volition, but as an, as an effect of repeated efforts that become directional in time. He describes efforts in a particular direction when they are sustained or habitually made by certain parts of a living body for the satisfaction uh, of needs established by nature or environment, cause an enlargement of the parts in the acquisition of a size and shape that they would not have obtained if these efforts had not become the normal activities of the animal exerting them. This is a quote with a lot of queer potential. So when an effort becomes normal, a form is acquired. This would help us explain the acquisition of, of, of heteronormativity as a social form indeed. When such form is acquired, less effort is needed. The giraffe does not have to reach so high to reach the foliage. So use inheritance translates here as the lessening of the effort required to survive within an environment, and that, that is in my language. At certain points, Lamarck does imply, or seem to imply, that a use for something would bring that thing into existence. And this is one of the reasons that Darwin was rather disparaging about Lamarck's work, because of the implication Darwin heard, rightly or wrongly, that nature has a design. We can find evidence of Darwin's disparagement in another used book, Darwin's personal copy of Lamarck's History Naturelle. Darwin wrote in the margins, because use improves an organ, wishing for it, or its use, produces it. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And I'm writing about exclamation marks as an example of overuse in, in, the, in the book. <laughs> oh. Despite how Darwin and Lamarck appear to deviate at least from Darwin's point of view on the question of use, Darwin himself often represents natural selection and the law of use and disuse as working together. And it's interesting to note that Darwin offers a reuse of the architect metaphor to describe the mechanism of natural selection, despite how that metaphor risks the implication of design. And I'm just going to give you this quote from, from Darwin, because it becomes very important to my analysis of institutional use shortly. Let an arch architect be compelled to build an edifice with uncut stones fallen from a precipice. The shape of each fragment may be called accidental, Yet the shape of each has been determined by the force of gravity, the nature of the rock, and the slope of the precipice, events and circumstances, all of which depend on natural laws. But there is no relation between these laws and the purpose for which each fragment is used by the builder. The shape of the fragments of the stone at the base of our precipice may be called accidental, but that's not strictly correct. For the shape of each depends on a long sequence of events, all obeying natural laws. But... In regard to the use to which the fragments may be put, their shape may be strictly said to be accidental. So an architect or a builder who makes use of stones without cutting them in order to fit a design is being called upon by Darwin here to do a certain kind of work. The stones are thrown up or they are available to be used according to natural laws, a history of determination. But they were not made in order to be used like the cup that has been shaped so that it can be filled by water. They become useful to the architect once he has begun building. So if the shape of the stones is determined by a long sequence of events, it is an accident that the shape of this stone fits the shape of the hole in the wall. So you are more likely to use the stone that happens to fit that space. So use here is hap, happenstance, and even, I would say, happy. So I'll be returning to Darwin's happy use of the architect metaphor in due course. So this second section is called the institutional as usual. The institutional is what I'm usually talking about in one way or another. <clears throat> so in the re reflecting on the institutional as usual, I can thicken the account of use I've offered thus far. When we are habituated or attuned to the environment, we know what usually happens. 
We know about the institutional as usual by those who are trying to transform institutions. In my research into diversity and the university, which I first presented in my book on being included, I talked to diversity practitioners about their work. And going back to the data I collected, I've realized that diversity work requires becoming conscious of use and what we might call use patterns. If queering use brings use to the front, as was implied in Judith Butler's quote, then diversity work as such is an archive of queer use. Diversity workers are trying to transform institutional habits, not to follow the well-used paths, not to go the way things flow. Many of the diversity workers I spoke to for that project were appointed by the organisations that they were trying to transform. Even if diversity workers are appointed by institutions to transform institutions, it does not mean institutions are willing to be transformed. One practitioner described her work thus, it's a banging your head against a brick wall job. So here, a job description becomes a wall description. <laughs> so if you keep banging your head against a brick wall, but the wall keeps its place, it is you that gets sore. But what happens to the wall? It can seem like all you've done is scratched at the surface. And this is what diversity work often feels like, scratching the surface, scratching at the surface. And then, even then, even if you've only scratched the surface, you can still be liable for damages. So doing diversity work often means you collect wall stories, as I described it in Living a Feminist Life. The wall, in other words, becomes data, snapshots that reveal the institution, often by revealing what the institution does not want revealed. So let me share with you a wall story. It's one story that I've been drawing upon uh, across a range of projects, and it's a long story. Wall stories are usually quite long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when I was first here, there was a policy that you had to have three people on every panel who had been diversity trained. But then there was a decision early on when I was here that it should be everybody, all panel members, at least internal people. They took that decision at the Equality and Diversity Committee, which several members of SMT were present at. But then the Director of Human Resources found out about it and decided we didn't have the resources to support it, and it went to council with that taken out. And council were told that they were happy to have just three members. Only a person on council who was an external member of the Diversity Committee went ballistic, and I'm not kidding, went ballistic, and said the minutes didn't reflect what had happened in the meeting because the minutes said the decision was different to what actually happened, and I didn't take the minutes, by the way. And so they had to take it through and reverse it. And the council decision was that all people should be trained. And despite that, I have then sat in meetings where they just continue saying that it has to be just three people on the panel. And I said, but no, council changed their view and I can give you the minutes. And they just look at me as if I'm saying something really stupid. This went on for ages, even though the council minutes definitely said all panel members should be trained. And to be honest, sometimes you just give up. So it seems here as if there's been an institutional decision but individuals within the institution must act as if the decision has been made for it to have been made. If they do not, it has not. So a decision made in the present about the future is overridden by the momentum of the past. The past becomes a well-worn path. What usually happens still happens. So in this case, the head of personnel did not need to take the decision out of the minutes for the decision not to bring something into effect. I call this dynamic non-performativity. <laughs> when naming something does not bring something into effect, or even more strongly, when something is named in order not to bring something into effect. So the wall is that which keeps standing. I now think of the wall as a finding. Let me summarize that finding. What stops movement moves. In other words, the methods for stopping something are mobile, which means that when we witness the movement, we can miss the mechanism. And I think this is actually really important. 
because organizations tend to be quite good at creating evidence of movement. Creating evidence you are doing something is not the same thing as doing something. <laughs> yeah. This is why I've called diversity workers institutional plumbers. You have to work out where the blockage is and what's stopping something from moving through the system. So in our example, what stopped something from happening, it could have been the removal from the minutes. So the, the, the head of human resources could have had a hand in it, but it wasn't. It could have been the failure of anyone at council to notice this removal, but it wasn't. It could have been a failure of the quality officer to put the decision back into the minutes, but it wasn't. It was instead how people acted within the organisation after the policy had been agreed, which means that agreeing to something can be another way of stopping something from happening. So a diversity policy can come into existence without coming into use. I noted earlier how a sign is often used to make a transition from something being in and out of use, such as in the case of the post box. Institutions are postal systems. So maybe the diversity worker deposits the policy into the post box because she assumes the box is in use, and she has good reasons. She's following the procedure. The post box that is not in use might have another function to stop the policy from going through the system a policy becomes dusty, rather like Marx's rusty sword, from rusty to dusty. A policy can become unusable by not being used. Consider, too, all the energy this practitioner expended on developing a, pol a policy that did not do anything. The story of how the wall keeps standing is the same story as the story of how a diversity worker becomes shattered. As she says, sometimes you just give up. Maybe you end up feeling used up or limp or spent, rather like this tube of toothpaste, as if you've got nothing left to give. Or maybe you fly off the handle to recall that broken cup, an expression that can mean to snap or to lose your temper. To lose a handle on things can mean to lose yourself. You become the one who can't handle it. You don't even have to say anything to be heard as breaking something. Another practitioner describes to me, you know, you go through that in these sort of jobs where you've got to say something, you can just see people going, oh, here she goes. We both laugh, recognising that each other recognised that scene. The feminist killjoy, that leaky container, comes up here. She comes up in what we hear. We hear each other in the wear and the tear of the words we share. We hear what it's like to come up against the same thing over and over again. We imagine the eyes rolling as if to say, well, she would say that. It was from experiences like this that I developed my equation, rolling eyes equals feminist pedagogy. <laughs> I think it's important to note here that the policy that was stopped by not coming into use was a policy about how academic appointments are made. Appointment panels are places to go if you want to learn more about how institutions are reproduced, how decisions are made about who is appointable, to use a much-used term in the British context, appointable. A person in a diversity training session I attended shared that people in her department had an unofficial criteria for appointability, which was whether somebody was the kind of person you could take down to the pub. They wanted someone who could inhabit those spaces with them, being with as being like, someone they could relate to, have a drink with, being with as being like. I remember one time a woman of colour was considered for a job. She worked on race and sexuality, and someone in a departmental meeting said with concern, but we've already got Sarah, as if having one of us was more than enough. <laughs> there was a murmur consensus that she replicated me, even though our work was actually quite different. There was no concern about other areas, political economy, for instance. Concern, no concern, how things stay the same by seeing others as the same. I want to go back to my discussion of uses of use. An institution is an environment, and environments are dynamic. It is because environments change that uses change. An institution is also, however, a container technology. 
You can reproduce something by stabilizing the requirements for what you need to survive or thrive in an environment. When a requirement is stabilized, it does not need to be made explicit. Use becomes instead a question of fit. Remember Darwin's use of the architect metaphor. The builder uses the stone that happens to fit. Use as a selection process. You select one stone from other stones, from many stones, one from many. It can appear as if that moment of use is hap, that this person is selected because they just happen to fit the requirements, rather like a stone is selected because it just happens to be the same shape and size as the hole in the wall. Selection, as we know, can be a process in which you're invited to participate. To get funding, say, you have to meet the requirements to fill in a form. A standard is what is created when you use the same form. Selection as the stabilization of form. But a selection can be made before that invitation is even sent out. Selection is a history of how a body takes shape, how a whole is created that is that same shape, a history of the institution as a history of what appears as coincidence, how those shapes are the same shape. And then hap is used ideologically, as if they are here because they just happen to fit, rather than they fit because of how the structure was built. A structure, the gradual removal of hap from use in the determination of a requirement. In Lamarck's model, use was inheritance. In shaping form, it lessens the effort required to do something within an environment. When you fit, and fitting here can be formal, a question of form, you can inherit the lessening of effort. So a path, say in the sense of a career path or, or even a life trajectory, is not simply made more usable by being used. Some have paths laid out more clearly in front of them because they already fit a requirement. It is not just constancy of use that eases a passage. Use is ease for those who inherit the right form whereby rightness means a degree of fit with an expectation. For, as before, acquires a new resonance here. When a world is built for some, they come before others. This final section is called Not Fitting. So people do come to inhabit organisations that are not intended for them. You can make the cut without fitting. If you arrive into an organisation that is not built for you, you might experience that for as tight or as tightening as restriction. If you are the one for whom an institution is intended, a for is loose, the institution appears as open because it was open to you. If use is a restriction of possibility that is material, as I suggested earlier, some encounter that restriction more than others. This is why I think of institutions as like old garments. It has acquired the shape of those who tend to wear it, such that it becomes easier to wear if you have that shape. And this is also why I think of privilege as an energy-saving device. Less effort is required to pass through when a world has been assembled around you. If you arrive with dubious origins, you're not expected to be there, so in getting there, you've already disagreed with an expectation of who you are and what you can do, then the institution is the wrong shape. Annette Kuhn describes how as a working class girl in a grammar school, she feels conspicuously out of place. She describes the sense of being out of place by giving us a biography of her school uniform, a kind of biography of youth. How by the time her ill-fitting uniform did actually come to fit, it had become too shabby and too scruffy to wear. The word wear originally derives from the Germanic word for clothing. It then acquires a secondary sense of use up or gradually damage from the effect of continued use on clothes. So it's not just that when something is used more, it fits better. If you are the wrong shape, you have to make more of an effort. It takes longer. Smooth then does not smooth, use then does not smooth a passage or enable a better fit, but leads to corrosion and damage. And this difference between use that smooths and enable and use that corrodes and damages is a distributed difference. Not fitting can be about the body you have, about your own requirements. When you don't meet the requirements, you become, to borrow Rose McGowell and Thompson's important term, a misfit. She describes being a person with a disability in an ableist institution as like being a square peg in a round hole. 
Fitting becomes work for those who do not fit. You have to push, 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 and sometimes no amount of pushing will get you in. It can be a misfit given what has become a routine. An organization that has long meetings without any breaks, sounds familiar, assumes a body that can be seated without breaks. If someone arrives who cannot maintain this position, they do not meet the requirements. So, for example, if you lay down during a meeting, you would throw the meeting into crisis. A social justice project might require throwing meetings into crisis. If a space has to be modified to enable you to participate, it is not just that it's harder for you to participate, although it is that. It is also that your participation is deemed disruptive to others. You might have to try to fit in. You have to try to fit in because or when you do not fit in. A woman of color describes this work. I think with a person of color, there's always a question of what's this woman going to turn out like? They're nervous about appointing people of color into senior positions because if I went in my sari and wanted prayer time off and started rocking the boat and being a bit different and asserting my kind of culture, I'm sure they'd take it differently. So some forms of difference are heard as rocking the boat, as if you're only different because you are insistent on being different. Trying not to cause disruption might require discarding parts of yourself, parts of your history, such as garments, a sari, say, or rituals, a prayer, words you cannot say, words you cannot say. Think of the word racism. Audrey Law describes so well how racism is heard as getting in the way of the smooth flow of communication. Any use of the word racism is heard as overuse. When words evoke histories they create, that create fiction, they sound louder, abrasive. Words can evoke histories, bodies too. Sometimes turning up is enough to bring a history up, a history that gets in the way of an occupation of space. I think of social categories as dwellings, as that which gives residence. We can recall the sign occupied. You can enter if the toilet is vacant. Even spaces that seem available for anyone to enter can be closed. Before you get to one door, you might have to get through another. You can be stopped from using the women's toilet because you are seen as not women. You become not only a body out of place, but a body that threatens those who are in place. You might have to become insistent to pee. And given that peeing is necessary for being, insistent to pee really means insistent to be. Some have to insist on belonging to the categories that give residence to others. A wall can be what you encounter when you arrive somewhere. You turn up at a hotel with your girlfriend and you say you've booked a room. They catch you in a glance and they hesitate. A hesitation can speak volumes. This reservation says your booking is for a double bed. Is that right, madam? <laughs> Eyebrows are raised. A glance slides over the two of you, catching again enough detail. Are you sure, madam? Yes, that's right. A double bed. You have to say it again. You have to say it again more firmly. Earlier I mentioned an equation, rolling eyes equals feminist pedagogy. I have another, another one, raised eyebrows equals lesbian feminist pedagogy. <laughs> really? Are you sure? This happens again and again, you almost come to expect it. The necess necessity of being firm just to receive what you've requested. This belief follows you wherever you go still. One time after a querying, are you sure, madam? Are you sure, madam? You enter the room and there's twin beds. Do you go down? Do you try again? It can be trying. Sometimes it's too trying, it's too much, and you pull your two little beds together and find other ways of huddling. <laughs> Queer use, another way of huddling, of keeping each other warm. For some, to be is to be in question. Is that your sister or your husband? That was a question once asked to me by a neighbor. <laughs> Who are you? What are you? Where are you from? As a brown woman living in the UK, I'm used to being asked that question, where are you from? Where are you really from? It's a way of being told you're not from here. Brown, not from here, not here, not. These questions can dislodge you. You come to wait for them. Waiting to be dislodged changes your relation to the lodge. Being noticeable can be how you are registered as being not from here. Sometimes you are not noticeable on that same register, not from here, not here, not. You might walk into a seminar room with a white man. You're both professors. But you can feel the gaze land upon him, plop, plop. 
You don't appear as professor because you are not how the professor usually appears. And he's addressed as the professor. If you were to say, hey, I'm a professor too, <laughs> you'll be heard as drawing attention to yourself. <laughs> Diversity work, how you end up appearing as drawing attention to yourself. What you have to say or do in order not to be passed over is treated as complaint about being passed over, whether or not it is. Complaint. I've just begun a new project on complaint. And this project was inspired by working with students on numerous inquiries into sexual harassment and sexual misconduct, which is to say, my project was inspired by students, and I thank all of you today. A complaint is treated as a crisis for an organisation as potential damage to its reputation. Students are warned that complaining would cause damage. It would damage their careers, reputations, relationships, lives. And that warning often works as a threat that you will lose the connections that you need to progress. So one student described, I was repeatedly told that rocking the boat or making waves would affect my career in the future and that I would ruin the department for everyone else. I was told if I did put in a complaint, I would never be able to work in the university and that it was likely I wouldn't get a job elsewhere. So here complaining becomes a form of self-damage as well as to damage to others, ruining a department, no less. This student goes on to describe for us how the pressure not to complain was exerted. In just one day, I was subjected to eight hours of grueling meetings and questioning almost designed to break me and stop me from taking the complaint any further. And she described to me in, 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 in minute detail the efforts to stop the complaint from getting anywhere. So a wall can be what comes up or a wall can be what comes down, a ton of bricks. And this is how power often works. You don't have to stop people from doing something. You just make it harder and harder for them to do something. Remember, deviation is hard. Deviation is made hard. Not only is it hard to complain, but a complaint about the damage you suffer is treated as damage to the organization. When I spoke out about sexual misconduct and sexual harassment, I too became the cause of damage. What a mess, Sarah. Look how much work you've created. <laughs> I became a leaky pipe, drip, drip. Organisations will try and contain that damage. Public relations is a form of damage limitation. In fact, this is how diversity often takes institutional form as damage limitation. But there is hope here. They cannot mop up all of our mess. One spillage can lead to more coming out, can lead, does lead. A leak can be a lead. A leak can be a feminist lead. After I shared the reasons for my own resignation, many people shared with me their own stories, their own institutional battles. Me too, it can spill out. A feminist ear can provide the release of that pressure valve. So just loosen the screw a little bit, a tiny, tiny little bit, and you might have an explosion. We need more explosions. This conclusion is called queer vandalism. <laughs> you can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> Damage limitation. This is how organizations end up using paper. Paper as papering over, to paper over the cracks, the leaks, the means by which blemishes on an institutional record are not recorded. Perhaps these blemishes become ours, we become damaged goods. Paper too can be papered over. In queer phenomenology, I called into question a fantasy of a paperless philosophy as part of a critique of how philosophy might be oriented toward a certain kind of body, one for whom materiality would be an unnecessary distraction, one who is given time freed for contemplation by how others do the work, the paperwork, the domestic work, the reproductive work, the care work. Paper matters. Paper can also be Queer. Paper can be used queerly. I'm reminded of Hami Baba's discussion of the uses of the Bible in signs taken for wonders. Baba cites the missionary register from 1817. Still, every Indian would gladly receive a Bible, and why? That he may store it up as a curiosity, sell it for a few pice, or use it for waste paper. 
such it is well known has been the common fate of those Bibles distributed in this place. Some are seen laid up as curiosities by those who cannot read them. Some have been bartered in the markets and others have been thrown into snuff shops and used as wrapping paper. The Bible, in not being properly read, is willfully destroyed, becoming curiosity, reused or usable for other purposes, wrapping paper, waste paper. Of course, the missionaries narrate the fate of the Bible in the colonies as a result of the inability of the natives to be able to digest it. It is true that such of the natives as can read have leisure enough to read the whole Bible, but they are so indolent, so fond of eating and sleeping, so lost in their vicious pursuits, that unless something at once brief, simple and powerful be presented, it will not be likely to be read by them. And if read, it will not be likely to arrest their torpid and sensual minds. If racism is used as an explanation of the failure of digestion, rendering the racial other a queer subject, vicious pursuits, torpid and sensual minds, racism is used because of the failure of the colonial mission to transform the minds of the colonized into willing vessels. The demand to use something properly here is a demand to revere what has been given by the colonizer. So empire as gift comes with use instructions. One of my conclusions is that we cannot simply affirm the queer potential of use. It's just not enough. And I hope you can hear why. We have to account first for how that potential has been stolen, a theft that exists alongside other thefts. The appropriation of a potential is not unrelated to the appropriation of persons. To queer use is to have a fight on your hands because it comes with punishment. If not to be subjected to the will of the colonizer is to queer use or even to become queer through misuse, perversion as self-revelation, then to queer use is to live in proximity to violence. To queer use is to linger on material qualities of that which you are supposed to pass over. It is to recover a potential for materials that have been left behind even by the colonizer, all the things you can do with paper when you do not follow the instructions. A recovery can be dangerous. The creativity of queer use becomes an act of destruction, whether intended or not, not digesting something, spitting it out, putting it about. What appears as a failure to use something properly becomes a refusal to use something properly. To queer use can mean to destroy that which is deemed worthy of reverence. Queer use as vandalism, the willful destruction of what is venerable and beautiful. Earlier, I described diversity workers as institutional plumbers. We might, from that description, assume that diversity workers are appointed to unblock the system. But I try to show how a blockage is how the system is working. The system is working by stopping those who are trying to transform that system. And this means that to transform the system, you have to stop it from working. The plumber might need to be the vandal, or even pass as a plumber in order to be a vandal, <laughs> appear to be fixing the leak in order to be creating that leak. We might have to throw a wrench in the works or become, to use Sarah Franklin's terms, wenches in the works, to throw our bodies into the system, to try and stop the same old bodies from being assembled, doing the same old things. The wench in the works has a queer kinship with the feminist killjoy. A kinship of figures can be a kinship of persons as non-reproductive agents, those who are trying to stop what usually happens from happening. If you stop the machine from working, you damage the machine. It is not just that queers are damaged or lost souls, though we may be that, but that queerness as such becomes damaging, how we can ruin things by living and loving in the wrong way. If queer desire causes damage, then damage becomes a queer cause, what we are willing to cause. Not following a family line is often understood as breaking a line, queer as snap, the moment you realize what you do not have to be. Queer as snap, snap, as if you are cutting up the family with a pair of scissors just by arranging your life in a different way. Not following something as destroying something, no wonder they find us to be destructive. So much is reproduced by the requirement to follow. Within the academy, you might be asked to follow the well-trodden paths of citation, to cite properly, to cite well, as to cite those deemed to have already had the most influ influence. The more a path is used, the more a path is used. 
the more he is cited, the more he is cited. <laughs> Not following something as destroying something. You can become a vandal by rearranging a text in a different way, by not citing any white men, for instance. <laughs> to speak of whiteness in the academy or of colonialism as a context in which an enlightenment philosophy happened is to bring up that scandal of the vandal. Decolonizing the curriculum as a project has indeed been framed as an act of vandalism, a willful destruction of our universals, knocking off the heads of statues, snapping at the thrones of the philosopher kings. Vandalism also becomes a tactic when we have to cut a message off from the body, a body, when a message, if traced to a source, would compromise that source. We might need to use guerrilla tactics, and we have feminist and queer histories to draw upon here, write names of harassers on books, put graffiti on walls. Yes, those scratches, we're back to those scratches. What is treated as damage can be a message sent out. We can reach each other through what appears to others as mere scratch and scribble. We were here, we did not get used to it. The riskier it is to speak out, the more inventive we might have to become. The requirement to be inventive is not just a matter of communication. Audrey Lord, in her poem, A Litany for Survival, evokes those of us who love in doorways, coming and going in the hours between dawns. You might have to use the less used paths, turn a doorway into a meeting place. You might have to try to slide by undetected, because being seen is dangerous when you are seen as dangerous. Queer youth can be a matter of survival, becoming fainter as your best chance of being at all. There might then be queer possibilities not only in use, how materials can be picked up when we refuse an instruction, but in not being of use. I noted earlier how selection involves the stabilization of form. The story, the institutional story, the institution's story, is that not to be selected is to cease to be what we might call institutional death. An institutional death is not the end of a story. It can even be the beginning of a queer and feminist life. There is a discussion in Origins of vestigial organs, parts that are no longer useful but linger, however dwindled, such as the small eye of the blind mole. These parts are sometimes called leftovers. Vestigiality is a retention of structures or attributes of ancestral species that have lost their functionality, another version of the strange temporality of use. Let me quote here from Origins. Rudimentary parts, as it is generally admitted, are apt to be highly variable. Their variability seems to result from their uselessness and consequently from natural selection, having had no power to check deviations in their structure. Uselessness. It can be a deadly assignment. I think we know this. A history of whom and what is discarded, how fragments are swept up and away. But we can pick up pieces. We can find other ways of telling the history of use and uselessness, hearing a queer potential in a sentence from a much used book. That potential, not being selected, is not to be checked, to have more room to roam, to vary, to deviate, to proliferate. If queer youth can be about survival, following the less well-used path in order not to be detected, queer youth can also be about creativity, the variations that are possible when you're not selected and rewarded for going the right way. Of course, not being selected also means not being supported. And so we have to create our own support system, queer handles, how we hold on, how our life can go on, when we are shattered, because we are shattered. No wonder then, the stories of the exhaustion of inhabiting worlds that do not accommodate us, the stories of the weary and the worn, the teary and the torn, are the same stories as the stories of inventiveness of creating something, of making something. I think of Lord. I always think of Lord. Audrey Lord spoke of herself as a writer when she was dying. She wrote, I'm going to write fire until it comes out of my ears, my eyes, my nose holes, everywhere. Until it's every breath I breathe. I'm going to go out like a fucking meteor. So she did. And so she did. She goes out, she makes something. She calls this capacity to make things through heat the erotic. Lord describes, there is a difference between painting a black fence and writing a poem, but only one of quantity. And there is for me no difference between writing a good poem and moving into sunlight against the body of a woman I love. 
Words flicker with life like sunlight on her body. A love poem, a lover as poem. I'm warmed by this thought of how we create things, how we break open containers to make things. We watch the words spill. They spill all over you. I think too of Sherry Moraga's poem, The Wilder. Moraga speaks of heat being used to shape new elements, the intimacy of steel melting, the fire that makes sculpture of your lives. Our desires. When you are blocked, when your existence is prohibited or viewed with general suspicion or just raised eyebrows, yes, they are pedagogy, you have to come up with your own systems for getting things through. How inventive. Quite something. Not from nothing. Something from something. A kitchen table becomes a publishing house. A doorway becomes a meeting place. A post box becomes a nest. Sometimes we have to work hard to know what is possible. Let's take this image as a queer teacher. It teaches us that it's possible for those deemed strangers, foreigners, to inhabit a space that has been assumed as belonging to others, as being for others to use. And note, an assumption can be what you reside in or how you reside in. The post box could have remained in use, the nest destroyed before it was completed, the birds displaced. A history of use is a history of such displacements, many violent. Displacements that are often unrecognized because of how things remain occupied. To queer use is to make usage a crisis. You have to make room because of how spaces have been occupied. And to make usage a crisis is work. It is hard and painstaking work. It is collective and creative work. I've been trying to describe the work of queering use one way or another in my work. And that work of description too is shared work. It is what we do with and for each other. This image has something else to teach us. Creating a shelter and disrupting usage can refer to the same action. A kitchen table becomes a publishing house, a doorway, a meeting place, a post box, a nest, a writing table, seemingly solitary, a queer gathering, Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, hi, my name is Sel Huang, and I'm on the board of CLAGS. Hi, I'm Devanuch Gupta. I am board co-chair of CLAGS. And together, we are very honored on behalf of board, staff, of, and all the members of CLAGS to recognize Sarah Ahmed for her lifelong dedication and showing us the uses of queer, queer vandalism. I'm going to do that. Okay, so I just want to announce that we are going to have a, a Q&A now, and after the Q&A, we have a lovely reception right outside the doors, and so please stay for that and interact more amongst, you know, yourselves and with Sarah. Before we go into Q&A, I have something important to share. Um, we will stop the live streaming now, and we'll go into Q&A. We have somebody with the microphone walking around? No? Okay, no, that's fine. So you just have to project your voice, you have to be a vandal. But I do want to say something, that the work of CLAGS is very important. It was a life-changing um, experience to be an activist in New York and be connected with CLAGS. Um, so to continue our work, we would like you 
to give $20 today and get a poster, which is a visualization of queer bibliography during the reception out there. Um, or you could join us or renew your membership on your phone and show the receipt to Stephanie Sue, who's our board member, and you will receive a poster. You'll get a poster. So I want to make that plug, plug as a contribution to CLAGS so we can keep our events open for the public. For 25, more than 25 years now, CLAGS has kept a space for queer theory alive in one of the largest metropolitan public institutions in the country. So support us. With that, I will leave you with Professor Ahmed. Yeah, and we do have, it looks like we do have microphones, so. Um, I guess if, you're, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and it will not be live streamed.